So Dan, thank you for the, for the warm introduction. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about myself. I am the Director of Instructional Design at the Wharton School, which is the business school of the University of Pennsylvania. As Dan said, I'm also a part-time lecturer at Penn where I teach both online and face-to-face -face courses in my academic field, which is folklore. I'm a folklorist by training. Prior to joining Wharton, I taught on an adjunct basis at a variety of schools in the Philadelphia area. I taught writing, I taught humanities, I taught literature, I taught folklore. Basically, I taught just about anything that anyone would let me teach. I taught uh, a wide range of learners and a wide range of circumstances, both online and face-to-face -face courses. Um, you can find me on social media. I've got the picture here that you can you know, find me on, on, on Twitter, um, you can recognize me by, by that masked picture. Uh, before I joined uh, the Courseware team, as I said, I taught on a wide range of circumstances, on a wide range of platforms, using a wide range of teaching tools, um, which really gave me a great foundation for thinking about how it is that we use technology to connect to and connect with students from a variety of backgrounds and teach in a variety of circumstances. Um, I joined the Courseware team at Wharton just about six years ago. I was the first instructional designer that the Wharton School hired. Now I lead a small instructional design team that's part of the courseware team at Wharton. Uh, and the courseware team administers and supports Canvas and related platforms for the school. When I joined six years ago, most of our faculty didn't really know what an instructional designer was. It took a long time to, to get over the, the you're just IT, right? I'm, I'm not IT, I'm not that kind of IT. I'm not the person who can fix their computer. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, one of the benefits for instructional designers anyway, of this pandemic year, is that almost no one asks what an instructional designer does anymore. Instructional designers are frequently the people that, that a wide range of folks across higher education go to for advice about different aspects of course planning, course operations. Um, we're frequently, some people sometimes refer to us as sort of the glue that, that holds higher education together. And during this pandemic year, instructional designers across the world have been called upon to help make that happen in a variety of capacities. Um, instructional designers in higher education can do a lot of different things depending on uh, where you're situated within, within um, a higher education organization. So to tell you a little bit about where I am, I'm at the Wharton School, which is the business school of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the Wharton School is one of 12 schools within the University of Pennsylvania, and we have, um, we have four degree programs, and the courses that I'm associated with are primarily those that are for credit-bearing degree programs and related initiatives. Uh, we have about 2,600 undergraduates about 1,800 MBA students, um, about 450 or so executive MBA students, and, and our executive MBA students are spread across um, the East Coast in Philadelphia and the West Coast in San Francisco. And then we have about 200 PhD students at any point in time. So in total, we have about 5,000 or so students. Across, so we have 5,000 students across these four degree programs. And when we look across the university, when we look across the courses that we teach um, and, and hold over the course of a year, we actually teach about 7,000 students. So there are about 2,000 students ac uh, across the academic year from the rest of the University of Pennsylvania who take courses at Wharton. So in this sense, there's a lot of diversity that we see within, um, there's a lot of diversity that we see within the Wharton School. Um, and so this, the topics that I'm going to be talking about today are ones that really matter to, to us. I'm going to be talking about universal design for learning, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about how that contributes to our, our efforts around diversity and inclusion and equity and how we can take these into consideration uh, in the course design process. So what is universal design for learning? I'm going to start there. The idea of universal design for learning uh, is borrowed from architecture. And in architecture, it refers to the goal of designing the built environment in a way that makes it usable for a wide range of people. So it, it's de designing the, the built environment so that it can be used by anyone or just about anyone, as many people as possible, regardless of age or ability or status. One of the um, go-to examples that people often use 
uh, for this is um, you may be familiar with the uh, with the curb cutouts on sidewalks that make it easy for um, for wheelchairs to get onto a sidewalk to be able to safely move on the sidewalk. Well, it turns out those curb cutouts, and this is something that, that Philadelphia currently is in the process of updating the curb cutouts across the city, and they're doing this in my neighborhood right now, so this is something that's top of mind. It turns out that this makes it easier, not just for people who are in wheelchairs, to, to cross the street and to use the sidewalks, but also people who have strollers or people who are, um, who are uh, carting things in a cart or um, Sadly, also bicycles who are not supposed to be on the sidewalk, it also makes it uh, use, uh, more useful for them too. So instructional, um, universal design rather, is really tied to the idea that we want to make whatever we're building as useful as possible for as many people as possible. Now, it's almost never possible to make it available, to make it useful to everyone because so many people have such a wide range, range, range of needs but the idea is to hit as many of those as possible from the beginning. So to do that, universal design for learning has two key principles. First, we want to address learner variability. And second, we want to reduce the barriers that learners have to the learning process. So those are the two key principles of universal design for learning or UDL. And I'm gonna be talking about each of those in turn. So thinking about, thinking about learner variability, we can begin to see some of what we mean by learner variability by looking at just a segment, just some stats about the incoming students at Wharton. So here I'm showing you a profile of the, I don't have sadly the students who've just been admitted because we don't yet know who all is coming, but from um, the, 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 st the students who just completed their first year in our undergraduate program and our MBA program, we can see some stats about some, some learner variability stats here. Um, among the undergraduates, and again, we have about 2,600 undergraduates in total. This year's incoming class, about 60% of the incoming undergrad of the first year undergraduates who are US citizens or permanent residents self-identify as a student of color. About a quarter of our incoming students are international, and 12% are first generation college. That means their parents did not go to college, their parents don't have college degrees. And first generation students can often have, um, can often uh, encounter a lot of um, barriers to being successful because there's a lot of background information about what it takes to be successful that they, that they may not be as familiar with. When we look at our MBA students, we see a similar kind of learner variability among the, um, the, the, um, the, the about 900 students who started this past year. Uh, there were 70 countries represented among those first year students. Um, international students accounted for about 20% of our students and um, LGBTQ plus students account, uh, self identify uh, at, at about 6% of our students. So the Wharton School is a business school at an Ivy League university. And just from these stats, you can see that our students come from a variety of backgrounds. They speak a variety of languages. They bring with them a rich diversity of cultural and educational experiences. But this really only just begins to tell the story about learner variability. When we think about learner variability in other educational contexts, some other stats are kind of important to keep in mind. When we look at the adult population in the United States, about one in four adults in the United States lives with some sort of disability. When we look at students, that number is a little bit lower. Um, I've seen different numbers for the different statistics for the number of students who are dealing with um, with uh, an, an undoc either a documented or undocumented disability. And that, that stat, depending on whose stats you're looking at, can be one in six, can be one in 10, can be as high as one in five. I've seen a number of different stats here. So I didn't, I didn't include that because there's a lot of, those numbers differ. Many of the disabilities that our students experience are not visible. So um, when you're looking at students, you, you don't necessarily know what's going on with them. And 
uh, the, the increasing number of first generation students that we have, not just at schools like Wharton, but at, at schools across the country, across the world, um, especially in our, uh, in our community colleges, um, have an increasing number of students who are first generation students and they may be coming to college not as well prepared to navigate university settings. As we've learned during this past pandemic year, many of our students are uh, dealing with a wide range of challenges in their lives. They may have work obligations, they may have family and caregiving obligations, um, and their access not just to financial resources, but their access to broadband at home also varies. And so this is, these, are, these are some differences in learner variability. Just, and again, this still doesn't tell the, the full picture. This just gives us a, a, a beginning to, to sort of put the pieces in place for the kinds of variations among our learners that we're encountering. So in the context of courses and course design, when we think about uh, learner variability, um, this can play out in a lot of different ways. And we'll be talking about that shortly. So the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated a lot of this, um, has exacerbated the, uh, many of these factors, and it's raised awareness of them for instructional designers, for educators, for technical support, for, for university and college administrators, and for people uh, sort of across the spectrum that we're dealing with about these issues and about how learner variability can affect the experiences of our students. So this variability can lead to a wide range of barriers, a, a, a wide range of circumstances that can make education more challenging for students. So our students can have a lack of background knowledge for the topics that we're talking about. They can be confused about the next steps that they need to take in completing learning activities and assessments. Um, in a world where uh, class size is increasing, where 70% um, of, of university educators are contingent faculty members who are not in tenured or tenure track positions. That often means high teaching loads for many of, for, for many of our faculty. And that unfortunately can sometimes go hand in hand with students not receiving timely feedback on things that they turn in. So this can also be a barrier to learning. Um, our students can just be unfamiliar with, with the vocabulary, with the symbols, with the terminology that's, that's critical to uh, what they're, to, to the classes that they're taking. Um, there can be difficulties navigating both social, emotional, and also increasingly mental health challenges for our students that can, that can be a barrier to their learning. Um, as our student population becomes increasingly diverse, the coursework that we ask them to complete it may be less relevant to them culturally, uh, may be less interesting to them, and that can also be a type of barrier. And then obviously, I, I don't mean to, to, to suggest that this is least because this is the last on the list, but both technical and financial obstacles are very real and present uh, obstacles uh, for our students in the current learning environment. So, this, so the second principle of UDL, so the first principle is, is addressing learner variability, and the second principle is about reducing those barriers. So I'm, I'm not proposing solutions here just yet, but I just wanna get you thinking about how it is that we can reduce these barriers. So how can we make courses that are easier, not harder for learners to participate in? How, being aware that not all students who need accommodations will have the documentation to, um, to, to get those accommodations. How can we set up courses to take those sorts of needs into consideration already so that students are able to complete work without having to first complete a lot of paperwork that can take a lot of time. So, so this is this general question that I wanna ask you all to think about is how can we make courses accessible to students without requiring that paperwork? Um, and, and answers to those questions can be addressed in a variety of ways. 
and instructional designers are especially well positioned to begin to help to inform the, the choices that that faculty are making to do this. So um, one way of addressing this is through the universal design universal design for learning framework, uh, which is a uh, deliberate planning to help reduce these barriers. So the Universal Design for Learning Framework was initially developed in the 1990s by the Center for Applied Special Technology or CAST. Um, the, uh, what you see here was adapted from CAST's uh, Universal Design for Learning Guidelines version 2.2 and um, CAST is currently in the process of revising these guidelines again in a way that will take into, into consideration uh, issues of inclusive learning and uh, diversity and equity. So there are three primary um, issues, three primary sort of parts of this framework that um, we'll just, just have a, a chance to just begin to touch on today. And the first one is that there are multiple means of engagement. So multiple means of engagement is sort of the why of learning. Why students are interested, um, how they'll be engaged or motivated to learn. And the important thing to be aware of as we think about the learner variability is that there's no single means of engagement that will inspire all students to learn. So we wanna think about how can we design courses in a way that will activate learners existing interest, that will provide them with some autonomy in their learning experience, that will provide them some choice in the topics or approaches that they use for their assessments, and all the while being aware of the that that the um, that the there can be a variety of demands that uh, that can challenge learners. The second part of the UDL framework uh, is multiple means of representation. This is the what of learning, the content of learning, and um, so multiple means of of representation here can be understood in a couple of different ways. And again, just like with the multiple means of engagement, um, with multiple means of representation, there's no single means of rep representation that will work best for all students. So offering a variety of ways for students to access course content, um, a variety of ways for them to perceive what's going on. Some of it might be in text, some of it might be in video, some of it might be face-to-face opportunities. This becomes really important to helping students to learn and providing multiple ways for them to access information and to acquire knowledge. And then the third part, the third uh, part of the UDL framework is multiple means of action and expression. So this is the how of learning. What is it that students are doing? How are they navigating the course, both in real life and physical space? How are they navigating the virtual course elements in terms of using the LMS, in terms of using any tools that work with the LMS. Um, we can differentiate ways that students can also differentiate ways that students express themselves and demonstrate that they have that they have acquired the material that you want them to learn. So this multiple means of expression again highlights that no single means of action or expression will work best for everyone. So providing them with multiple opportunities and allowing students some choice, ideally, it's not always possible, but when possible, allowing them some choice in ways in which they can, they can proceed works best. So these are, what I've introduced thus far is what's called universal design for learning. Uh, in the current current in the current moment, we are uh, we are different organizations are recognizing the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in learning and working environments. And universal design for learning as a framework can really readily and easily accommodate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, there are lots of ways of fostering inclusive learning and many institutions, many educational institutions are turning their attention to this with, um, with uh, shifting efforts to fostering diverse learning, to incorporating uh, inclusive teaching principles and um, incre an increasing number of faculty are uh, focusing their research on DEI efforts. Um, 
and there's a there's really good reasons for this. Um, it turns out that doing this is is just good for business. Um, when faculty, when students, when staff reflect the richness of human identity and thought, we all do better work. However, one of the things that is really important to keep in mind is that when we look at the landscape of people on a college campus, frequently it's students who first embody this. So we, we see much more diversity among student population than we, than we see in faculty and staff. And so faculty and staff need to do extra work to make sure that they're meeting the demands of their students. Okay. And the last part of my talk, I want to begin thinking about some considerations for inclusive course design. Um, we have, I know we have only a few minutes left here. I want to make sure that we've got some time for, for, for questions and answers. So I want to begin the conversation about inclusive course design. And uh, so UDL principles, universal design for learning principles, um, can help support inclusive course design efforts. And I'm really just going to touch on some, some big high level things to think about here. And instructional designers and educators who are here today at Inspirid uh, can really influence or establish, depending on the role that you play, um, the kinds of course policies and assessments and technologies that can really help to make courses inclusive and accessible for everyone. So I'm going to talk about that in four, very briefly in four contexts, course policies, course materials, activities and assessments, and then technology use. So in terms of course policies, one of the most important things that can be done is to set expectations for students, usually high expectations, make it clear what students need to do, and provide them with the support that they need to get there. Course policies that are more flexible in terms of deadlines can really help to meet student success. And as I think, so many of us have learned over the course of the past year, unexpected things happen in life. So where possible, it is not always possible, I recognize, but where possible, flexibility and deadlines can really be helpful. Fostering a growth mindset, recognizing uh, and, 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 and incorporating this into how you talk about course materials is, is important. And normalizing the struggle that students go through as part of the learning process. This can all be done within the context of your course policies and how you communicate with students. In the before times, one of the things that was very common in many courses at Wharton was that many courses had no device policies in the classroom. Um, one of the things that I hope to see as we move forward into the post-pandemic times is increased flexibility around the use of the use of personal technology in the classroom, which can really make things easier for, for a variety of students. And then two things that go hand in hand uh, that, that, that are part of course policies is attendance and participation. And I think it's really important for uh, to consider and reconsider and re reconsider why it is that you are asking, uh, why it is that you may be requiring attendance and if there are other ways in which students can demonstrate attendance, whether that is watching a recording of a session, um, per participating asynchronously in course content, and think about why, why does attendance matter as a metric? And is there something else that can be done to make a course more inclusive for students who may, on any particular day, not be able to make it to class so that they are not penalized for that? And then also reconsidering participation policies. One of the things that we know is when students are given more opportunity to consider their responses, they do better. So participation policies that allow for uh, a wide range of participation can be really important. Course materials, this is the second thing that I wanna talk about. Um, course materials can be made more inclusive in a variety of ways, uh, providing, the, perhaps the most important one is to provide access to course materials at low or no cost, if at all possible. This can be done through e-reserves, through open educational resources, through in, instructor-generated materials. Um, chunking content to avoid cognitive overload for students is also important. Um, making those materials accessible through the LMS, if at all possible, uh, makes, reduces a barrier to students locating those materials. 
Um, and then whatever materials that you're including, ensuring that those are accessible, whether that is making sure that there's captions or transcripts or accessible PDFs, uh, th this, is, this is an important part. And then if at all possible, including examples or case studies or course content that includes a variety of cultural references rather than ones that are only that are only come from a, a particular uh, and homogenous uh, uh, cultural context. And then again, making course content available asynchronously. In terms of activities and learning activities and assessments, it is really important when possible to offer students a choice in assessments. Um, it is uh, one of the things that we know that can also lead to success is providing students with examples of successful student projects so that they have a sense of what it is that they're working toward, um, including opportunities for reflection within uh, their, the learning context, offering frequent low stakes assessments uh, and assignments um, can reduce the, the pressure to perform um, ideally in, in every circumstance, um, using active learning strategies rather than passive ones and using group work. There are some special considerations for group work, of course. You wanna think carefully about how you're planning groups so as to make sure that students feel like they belong and that they're not, um, that they're not excluded. And then again, planning opportunities for feedback. Uh, feedback to students, feedback from students to peers, and feedback for faculty about how they're doing. And then finally, some thoughts about technology use. This may sound a little strange coming from uh, an instructional designer who works in an IT organization, but use technology deliberately and judiciously. Don't overuse technology. The cognitive load associated with students having to learn a new system is significant. So when you can reuse the same systems that can make things a lot easier for students. More technology is not always the right answer. So select the appropriate technology for what you're trying to do. Match what you're trying to do to what's possible in the tools. When possible, please give grading and feedback through the LMS that makes it so much easier for students to access that feedback. And then consider what's appropriate, consider what's possible and make decisions that make sense. So if assignments have to have closed dates, if, stu if students should be able to see what their peers are doing, um, if automatic grading is a possibility, these are all things that can be accomplished through many of the technology tools that we use, but make sure that you're making choices that make sense for the context that, for the learning context that you're in, because it can be really easy to, um, to select a setting that, do that, that does not do what you want it to do. And so um, just like our students learning process, the teaching process is iterative. So as you conclude one class and move into another class, consider what worked, consider what didn't, consider what needs to be changed, consider where you can work uh, and do better for future iterations of the course, and also get feedback both from your peers, from your students, and uh, bring that into future courses. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you all for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I welcome any uh, questions or thoughts or feedback that you have. And I really look forward to the discussions that we'll have uh, the rest of today and tomorrow um, that, that will help to illuminate different examples of uh, what we've been talking about here today so far. Thank you. Linda, thank you very much. You timed that perfectly. It's just coming up to uh, 40 minutes past the hour leaving us a nice tidy five minutes to take some questions and I'm going to post them here in our zoom chat and also from first to last just repeat them through to you so first we have a question from Aboy Burkaula who says Linda would you advise to use personas four to five to get to know your students better if you're teaching in large classes of course to follow up and try to meet their various learning needs so um there are, when you say uh, to use personas, yeah, the, the idea of personas in instructional design refers to thinking about, um, to think, to identifying the different kinds of learners to, to, and, and the idea of creating a persona refers to um, developing a, an idea of, of who that person is. You might think about this like, in, like kind of like creating a role-playing character 
So a little bit about their background, a little, a little bit about what motivate might motivate them, a little bit about what their challenges might be. If you're familiar with the students who are in your program, this can be a really helpful thing. Um, this can be a really, really helpful thing to keep in mind. Um, if there's a great deal of variability in your program, um, you um, four to five personas, I hopefully will 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 meet your needs. Um, depend if you're in an instructional design role, uh, uh, creating personas can really help there. Um, most faculty that I work with, the idea of using personas is something that is really really foreign to them. So this is not necessarily a, a concept that would work for them. But I would I would have in mind personas and say and and bring up an example of the type of student that a particular persona reflects and bring that up as a way of of talking about the kinds of challenges that a particular type of student might re might represent. So yes, I guess that's the 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 TLDL the TLDR in that is yeah, use personas but be careful about mentioning the term persona or talking about a particular persona to your faculty. You might wanna just abstract what you learn from thinking about those personas um, to, your, to the faculty or to the subject matter experts that you're working with. Thanks very much. Um, Mr. Vergaula left a couple more questions, but I'm afraid I'm gonna skip them. So we have time for the others. Of course, you can meet together in person afterwards if you'd like to learn more. Next up we have from Karen and Holly. Is there anything you would change or add to your presentation when considering just graduate and adult learners? That, Caroline, that is a really excellent question. Um, the needs of our graduate and adult learners. So we have, grad, obviously, we have we have um, adult uh, graduate learners in our who are enrolled in our MBA programs, um, and we have a very a, a very different kind of adult learner in our executive MBA programs and. Um, uh, a different still yet kinds of adult learners who are enrolled as PhD students. Um, Wharton also has uh, has an executive education program that I am only peripherally related to, but that's again yet other kinds of of adult learners. Um, they have very different needs. Uh, the three pop the three populations of, of graduate learners that I talked about are MBA students, our executive MBA students and our PhD students all have very different needs. So in terms of thinking about just graduate and adult learners, um, the kinds of issues that are particular to first generation learners um, manifest themselves in different ways when we're talking about, about uh, graduate students, right? Graduates, based, for the most part, most graduate students have already completed um, four years of undergraduate work, at least in the United States. Um, otherwise, they, they would not be getting into a graduate program. So there's a lot about the university system that they have already, that they've already learned to navigate. Um, however, depending on whether you're talking about uh, graduate students in a pre-professional program or graduate students in uh, humanities, um, they may have some very different concerns, especially around financial issues. Um, the what's expected of graduate students in the humanities is quite different from what's expected of an MBA student. So if I were focusing just on graduate students and adult learners, um, I would absolutely want to tease apart uh, the, the varying ways in which um, we see inequities uh, across different fields. Um, the ways in which there are particular kinds of financial pressures that, that are manifested in different ways. And also, obviously, the ways in which different kinds of adult learners have many more um, out of school obligations. Uh, the, 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 the family obligations may be much more present for, um, for adult learners and graduate students than for uh, undergraduates. Not that they're absent from undergraduates. I taught at, at Temple University for six or seven years, and um, those concerns were absolutely present in my, my Temple University students, for instance. So it's not that they're absent. They just tend to be more present for, um, for graduate students. And okay. I there, and thank you. I have so much thank more you. to hear about at UDL, but thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you so much and thank you to, to everyone for taking the time to come here today to listen.